Uh, yeah, thanks, Brian, for the kind in invite to the webinar and for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, as Brian already said, I uh, used to be the spokesperson of one of the doctoral researcher representations that are gathered in this N Square network um, of the Max Planck PhD net back in 2018. By now, I'm a postdoc at TU Graz, um, so I'm not a PhD candidate anymore, but I still serve in the advisory board of N Squared. Uh, and as a member of the advisory board, I am especially uh, concerned uh, or occupied with um, yeah, supporting our survey, surveying work and um, yeah, pushing mental health, the topic of mental health a bit further. So um, what Vanessa and I are going to talk to you about today is um, the like main or umbrella topic of how to win support uh, for the well-being of early career, career researchers based on our experience um, working in the representation of early career researchers. And we're also going to present um, rather detailed results of our last survey uh, about mental health in doctoral researchers in Germany and what uh, factors of academic life mental health is connected to. Um, if anybody wants to follow my slides on their own computer, I posted a link uh, here. It's also in the chat. Um, the slides will contain a couple of links that can be clicked. So uh, yeah, if you want to follow along, slides are available. Okay. So um, yeah, a, a short overview of, of the presentations, our two presentations. First, I will introduce you a bit to how our um, doctoral research representations are organized. Uh, and how they're organized to, to effectively drive change. Um, I will then introduce the results of uh, one survey that we did solely in the Max Planck Society and the second survey that we did um, within N squared uh, together. Uh, and uh, there I will focus on the results regarding mental health uh, and also on some first steps that uh, yeah, came from these surveys uh, in the direction of improving mental health. And then Vanessa is going to take over and uh, introduce you to current and future, future actions um, in the area of improving mental health. Okay, so um, what is N Squared? N Squared is an umbrella organization that um, unites the PhD representations of the three of the four largest non-university research organizations in Germany, plus associate members. Uh, those three research organizations are the Max Planck Society, the Helmholtz Association, and the Leibniz Association. Uh, each of those um, organizations has between 20 and 30,000 employees in Germany and between four and 6,000 doctoral researchers. The associate members, um, there's uh, first and foremost the IPP Mainz, that is also represented by Vanessa here, um, but we're currently also in discussions with um, especially uh, PhD representations in universities in Germany to also become members of N Squared. So N Squared is uh, not a closed set of organizations. It's uh, trying to represent um, yeah, the whole spectrum of doctoral researchers in Germany and is, is very inclusive and open to welcoming new members. Um, yeah, how are these doctoral researcher representations organized internally? I'm, going to give you the example of the Max Planck PhD net here because that's the network that I was the spokesperson of and that I know um, intimately. So um, the Max Planck PhD net um, is organized in a way that reflects the Max Planck Society in itself. The Max Planck Society itself uh, is um, distributed over 85 institutes um, with three focus research topics in three sections. One of them is biology and medicine, one of them is uh, human sciences, and the third section is chemistry, physics, and technology. And each of these institutes has an elected PhD representative. And the property of being elected is a very important one here because it gives a democratic legitimization for what we do. Um, this was actually codified in our statutes of the Max Planck PhD net back in 2015. Before that, it was more of an appointment process or some PhD representatives just yeah, st st stepped up and, and joined because they were interested in the matter. But uh, yeah, as soon as, as things got rather serious and we really claimed to represent the majority of doctor researchers, this process of getting elected representatives um, yeah, was very important to, to gain credibility. Um, 
the 85 institutes of the Max Planck Society are distributed over all of Germany and a handful of them are also um, outside of Germany, Netherlands, US, uh, Italy and Luxembourg. Um, and these, uh, the representation in these institutes is organized on different levels. One of them is re regional. So institutes that are close together in space will join up to form regional hubs and organize activities together. For example, yeah, barbecuing activities or joint talk series, career uh, events, stuff like that. Um, things that can be done um, outside of a given discipline because uh, institutes that are close together in space might not necessarily do the same kind of science, right? Um, and then uh, the uh, elected representatives of the different institutes also um, organize themselves into working groups and into a, a steering committee, the so-called steering group. So every year, all the elected representatives get together in a two to three day meeting and they elect their steering committee and they also form working groups that are concerned with different topics. Uh, there is, for example, a working group that is concerned with career issues and uh, yeah, organizes career activities, tries to come up with, with um, initiatives on how to improve career transitions for doctoral researchers. There's an open science working group, there's an event working group, an equal opportunity working group, and there's also a survey working group, which will be the most important working group for the remainder of this talk, because this working group um, organizes the um, biannual, bi so every second year, um, survey that happens um, in the Max Planck PhD net, now also within N squared, and that assesses uh, the state and the working conditions and the supervision conditions of all the doctoral researchers that work in the Max Planck Society. Um, this uh, kind of uh, organization that, that we had have there with the elected representatives and the working groups um, has turned out to be quite successful in the past, I'd say. Um, so we have elected representatives in most of the 86 Max Planck institutes. It fluctuates a bit, plus minus one every year, but we're consistently above 80 institutes that are represented within the Max Planck PhD net. Um, just to list uh, a couple of our major successes in the past, in 2015, we managed to change all of the doctor researchers um, employment in the Max Planck Society from stipends to contracts, which is very important because contracts give social security, whereas uh, stipends um, yeah, don't give you uh, retirement benefits and uh, don't automatically enroll you in the, in the health insurance and so on. Um, in 2019, we managed to lobby for an increase of paid vacation days from 20 to 30 days per year. Uh, and um, very new last year, we actually managed to increase the base salary from 50% contracts to 65% contracts, which is a pretty significant salary bump, um, especially for doctoral researchers that work in fields like the humanities or also in some life science institutes um, that don't benefit from, from uh, the uh, yeah, larger salaries that um, PhD uh, researchers in engineering or computer science would get by default. So yeah, these are um, things that were we that we were able to do, and um, yeah, one of the foundations of our lobbying efforts has always been information um, about the state of the doctoral researchers. Um, we. To, to lobby and to, to argue within our organization, we have always used data that we have collected about um, the doctor researchers we represent. And this data has always been front and center um, in our argument. And this data we collect through uh, yearly, now it's every second year because it's together with N Square um, survey that informs these policy changes. This survey that we uh, that we do is quite a large survey. It usually has between, let's say, 70 and 100 questions because it covers many, many areas that are important to working as a doctor researcher. It covers working conditions such as hours worked, salary, um, yeah, work on weekends. It covers supervision quality, the kind of support doctor researchers get from the supervisors. 
It covers equal opportunities, um, integration of international researchers. And uh, back in 2017, we also for the first time added mental health to the survey. Um, yeah, in, in 2017, this first survey on mental health, there we uh, included, um, I'd say in retrospect, a bit naive, um, but nonetheless very telling question. We asked participants um, if they suffered from one of seven symptoms, and those symptoms were back pain, sleeplessness, chronic fatigue, depression, migraines, burnout, and eating disorders. And those were self-assessments of the survey participants, and the results we got back were actually quite striking. So it turns out that only 34% um, of our respondents do not suffer from any of those symptoms. And all the other respondents suffer from one, some of them even from several of those symptoms. So if we compare these numbers to um, numbers that uh, come from service of the general population of um, people that are our age, but not working in academia, it turns out that the prevalence of these symptoms is uh, yeah, about two, even three folds the one in the general population. So it really looks uh, looked like there is a problem. Uh, doctoral researchers have a problem with mental health and something needs to be done about it. Um, yeah, uh, we, uh, we use these, these initial results that we got back in 2017 to yeah, start, uh, start a conversation with the Max Planck Society and notify them that there is a problem. And um, actually, already in 2017, we were then invited into the Occupational Health Management Working Group of the whole Max Planck Society to start working on these issues um, society-wide in collaboration with the general administration. But I'm going to, to get into that a bit later as well. Um, what also happened is that in reaction to the 2017 survey, we got a fair bit of criticism for the survey as well, mainly because we used um, such qualitative questions and uh, like self-assessment of, of participants. So the kind of criticism we got was, uh, yeah, well, but this is only self-assessed and maybe people feel bad, but they don't really are. Uh, and maybe only people who have symptoms respond to this question at all. Um, and it's not representative and, and whatnot. So um, in, we try, in our next iteration of the survey, we try to address all these questions and to really improve our, our standards here. And the next um, step in this process was a joint, joint survey within uh, N squared. So a survey that used the same questionnaire in all three of our organizations, the Max Planck um, Society, the Helmholtz Association and the Leibniz Association. Um, so we used this harmonized survey across all three organizations. We covered 15,000 doctor researchers uh, who were eligible to answer the survey and we got about um, 4,800 respondents. So that was quite, uh, quite a good um, return rate of the survey. For the refined methodology, especially um, for the mental health questions, we used the clinical depression invent inventory, the PHQ-9, and state and trade anxiety inventories to um, yeah, really uh, measure um, depression and anxiety with um, instruments that were uh, yeah, tested and acknowledged um, yeah, in, uh, in a professional way. Uh, and we also really um, tried to, for the first time, I think in, in history of such questionnaires, uh, assess mental health in connection to experience of power abuse. This was very important at the time because um, Germany in Germany, there were uh, a range of prominent cases of power abuse in non-university research institutions. And we had a hunch that um, experiences of power abuse might be connected to mental health. It's a bit of a no-brainer, but it was not um, really uh, put in numbers um, up to that point yet. So we included both sections, one section of mental health and one section of power abuse uh, to bring them together. Okay, so um, let's let's get to the meat of it, to the results of um, this survey. Uh, we find what we find um, pretty much reflects what we already found in the 2017 survey, but this time um, with hard numbers. Um, we find that especially for for anxiety, so for state and trade anxiety. Um, just for those who, who are not psychologists, um, the, the trade anxiety is the component of anxiety that is kind of um, a component of a person, 
like uh, it's called the trade, so it's a trade uh, that doesn't change in time so much. Uh, it's stable over time and the state anxiety is less stable over time. It's, it's associated to a state that the person has at the moment. So we try to assess these two components of anxiety and then um, of course depression. Well, we find that state and trade anxiety are, are pretty similar, yield pretty similar numbers. And we have, especially for anxiety, very high numbers. So for, for both anxieties, um, about half of the respondents report very high anxiety levels and very little, uh, only like a, a third respond with no or low anxiety. And this, I think, already tells us a lot about, uh, yeah, how uh, how much uh, of a problem anxiety is for, for early career researchers. For depression, the numbers don't look so grim. Um, only, yeah, about uh, 16, 17 percent um, suffer from um, severe to moderate depression. But uh, this number is still high compared to the general population, and it's still definitely too high to be acceptable. Um, now, since we have such a detailed survey that uh, asks um, questions on many different dimensions of a doctoral researcher's life, we are obviously able to relate these numbers to um, other information that we get about our respondents. First of all, we um, related these numbers to demographic factors. Um, what you can see here color coded in, uh, in red is high anxiety. This is just um, for, for state anxiety. Uh, in pink is moderate anxiety and in blue is no low anxiety. And the different bars indicate different stratifications for demographic factors. So um, I think uh, what is um, interesting to emphasize here is uh, when, we, when we stratify for um, nationality, we have German citizens within the EU and citizens outside of the EU. We see that especially the doctor researchers that come to us from outside the EU have an increased um, prevalence of anxiety here. I mean, to put this into perspective, 47% um, high anxiety in the German doctor researchers is not low. It's highly problematic. This is just to point out that um, doctor researchers from out the EU are even higher in that regard. We also see them when, when we compare male and female doctor researchers that um, female doctor researchers have higher levels of anxiety. And what we also see is that um, when we look at doctor researchers and we split them into those who are in the first year, second year and uh, third year or later in their PhD, that the level of anxiety really increases as the duration of the doctor of the PhD increases. Um, yeah, uh, for, for depression, we see a pretty similar trend as I pointed out for, for anxiety. And I think the main thing in addition to point out here is that um, for uh, doctor researchers that do not identify as male or female, um, the, the depression levels are really um, yeah, through the roof uh, compared to, to the other um, demographic splits. Uh, I have to add here that the numbers on, on other gender representations are, are low, about 4% of our respondents did not identify as male or female, but I think this is still a pretty strong indication um, that there is something off here. Um, yeah, uh, another interesting uh, thing to look at is working hours, um, time people spend working. Um, this is again uh, an analysis for depression. Uh, the, the different bars correspond to different hours worked. Here you have 30 or less hours per week, uh, up to 70 or more hours a week. Um, just to give a context on average, doctor researchers in our networks report to work about 43 hours a week um, and the contractually agreed upon working time is usually 30 hours. So there is quite a substantial amount of overwork um, being done. And we see that uh, as the work time increases uh, towards the 60 hours per week, um, yeah, the uh, amount of depression also increases. The numbers get a bit shaky as uh, the working hours um, surpass 65. This is mainly because there are so few respondents, thankfully, in this category. Um, so the numbers get noisy. Um, and what's also pretty clear is that the work on weekends seems to have an influence here. Um, people who uh, work on weekends never um, have lower levels of depression. And people who work every weekend, uh, as shown to the right here, 
type higher levels of depression. Um, now, um, let me uh, give a word of caution here. These are obviously only correlations. So there is no, no causal relation in this data because we did not do any interventions. So what I show you here is only correlations between different factors and uh, a measure of depression or anxiety. Um, I think these correlations could still be pretty informative um, to point out areas that could be looked at or should be looked at in relation to mental health. Um, yeah. Another interesting correlation here um, is uh, the correlation with um, precarious working conditions or um, contract duration. So um, on the left, I show you the number for depression. On the right, I show you the number for state anxiety. And uh, you can see that people who have um, a contract duration and in, or the longest contract duration of the whole PhD project was only six to 12 months have way higher levels of, of depression than those who started out with the longer contract, so 40, uh, 48 months or, or larger. Um, the same picture for anxiety. Um, the trend is not very strong, but at least there is a bit of a trend. Uh, yeah, um, then I think the strongest or one of the strongest correlations that we find between uh, depression slash anxiety and uh, other conditions of the PhD is the satisfaction with the supervision. Um, so the question was, how satisfied are you with your supervision? And the responses uh, range from very satisfied to very dissatisfied. And we can see that as we go from very, dissatis uh, very satisfied to very dissatisfied, um, the, the levels of anxiety really, really increase. So they more than double um, here. And for depression, we see pretty much the same picture. Uh, this, of course, could be uh, there is a bit of, bit of a chicken act one question here again. Um, are the people more depressed because they are unhappy with the supervision or are they unhappy with the supervision because they are depressed? Uh, but uh, yeah, it seems like there, there is a relation between the two. Um, yeah, uh, I already um, pointed out that uh, there is a relation between the duration of the PhD uh, and depression and anxiety. and that for me is a strong indicator that doing a PhD actually does something to your mental health. So it's, it's a bit odd that people in the third year generally report higher levels of anxiety and depression than people who just started. Um, so yeah, it seems like the longer you do your PhD, the more depressed and anxious you get. Um, yeah. Uh, I think one of the last uh, last interesting correlations I wanted to show you is the relation between experiences of um, bullying. Uh, so, um, yeah, one of the uh, I say symptoms of power abuse, and um, there the numbers are generally rather low because few people seem to be I see few people report. Um, that they had these experiences, which could either be that it's not prevalent or that people are not confident enough to report even in an anonymized survey. Um, but we see that people who never experienced um, any bullying by a superior have um, the average but still high levels of anxiety. And as we increase um, the severity of the experience with bullying from once over occasionally over monthly to daily, um, it seems also that there is a trend uh, that the uh, the anxiety increases substantially, and as we get to daily and weekly, the numbers become so low uh, that um, the numbers are pretty noisy again. Oops. Um, yeah, and then the the other question that related this to was um, experiences with sexual sexual harassment from a superior, and there again the numbers are low, uh, especially for the monthly and weekly experiences. Um, and uh, yeah, we see that for the group that never experienced any sexual harassment, sexualized harassment, uh, anxiety is, is average. And as we increase the, the frequency of experiences with sexual harassment, um, there are less and less people who report no anxiety at all. Um, to kind of put this all into a bit of a perspective, uh, it's, it's obvious that many factors are related to poor mental health. 
And this is just a map that shows you the correlation coefficients of state uh, anxiety and depression with several other factors that we measured in our survey. Uh, so if a correlation coefficient is way right and way up, that means it's stronger correlated with one of these other factors. Uh, and um, yeah, in general, depression and anxiety are very correlated with each other. Uh, and what is also interesting is that um, the correlation coefficients for um, things that are related to the working environment, like workload, work environment and atmosphere, this is what we termed this whole uh, category of experience with power abuse, support that people get, and also the, the supervision category, um, these uh, rank usually very highly or very uh, highly correlated with um, poor mental health. Um, what is not so highly correlated is the existence of psychological support. It's still correlated, um, but not, not as highly as other factors. And uh, there are factors that pretty much don't influence mental health, like office equipment or lab equipment. And what I personally take from this picture is that, yes, uh, increasing psychological support and, and giving seminars and so on, it does help. But what really influences poor mental health are the working conditions. And this is where, where the big gains are, I think, uh, which is obviously also the most difficult to change because these factors are very ingrained in the scientific system as we have it right now. Um, yeah, uh, this is just a, a very quick overview of the impact that we've had with that survey so far. Uh, Vanessa is going to detail that a bit more. Um, so yeah, as I already said, in 2017, the PhD net representatives were invited into this operational health management working group of the Max Planck Society, which was freshly formed at that time. Um, what we managed to get uh, deteriorating mental health recognized as an occupational hazard. This is might seem minor, but in Germany it's actually a big thing because occupational hazards are something that the employer has to take seriously because the employer is responsible for the health of their employees. And if the occupation that an employee has at that said employer is um, dangerous for their health, then the employer has to do something about it. So we really managed to get mental health recognized by the Max Planck Society as an occupational hazard and, and get them accountable to doing something about the bad mental health of the doctor researchers. Um, so yeah, um, the mental health of early career researchers um, became kind of the first focus topic of this operational health management, um, which led to the launch of an organizational wide so-called employee and management assistance program uh, in 2019. Um, yeah, and Vanessa is going to, to tell you what that is about. Uh, kind of my second to last slide is pointed to the full reports of the surveys where, uh, that I just gave you a glance into. I just showed you the numbers for the PhDNet uh, survey report for the Helmholtz and Leibniz survey reports. The numbers are very similar. You can find the full reports at these locations. And lastly, um, we have fully open sourced the questionnaire that we used, um, both the questions themselves as well as a um, implementation in Lime survey that can be um, yeah, hosted on a Lime survey instance. Uh, so you're very welcome to check out the questionnaire we used and to reuse it if you want in your own organization. Um, yeah, this is the link to the materials. And with that, I hand over to Vanessa and we're going to take questions in the end jointly. <laughs> 